Okay. So uh, welcome, welcome back. Uh, this is the third pseudo lecture, and uh, hopefully people are managing to get here. I feel like it's uh, getting easier uh, for me bit by bit to do this week by week, but still it isn't quite uh, smooth sailing. So here are the things I want to talk about today. Uh, one thing uh, that I'll spend about a third of the time on will be to uh, so to, fo uh, to follow up on things that you uh, discussed both on Zulip last time, but also in, uh, during the week as well, and in uh, comments to me. Uh, and so as a result, we're gonna also end up defining manifolds and things like that. Uh, and so that's, uh, uh, so that may make you happy, except I think my definition will make you unhappy. Uh, but the good thing is, hopefully, it'll make you unhappy in a way that wants make you want to be happier later on. And then uh, we'll move towards schemes and also varieties after, and then get to talk about sheaves a little bit more too, because we can spread that out. So my so again, the point of all this is going to be to set the stage for things. So I'm not going to tell you everything, but I will tell you what I think you really uh, should read in order to, uh, in order to, uh, under, to understand how these things work. Okay, so, uh, so let me remind me, especially shepherds, if I have to, if I should continually update the slides, because um, I will forget otherwise. Uh, and so great, so, la so, uh, so last time, uh, just as a reminder, we talked about pre-sheaves on topological space or sheaves on a topological uh, on topological space, uh, and uh, so a pre-sheaf of of something. Let me pick a good color. Uh, a pre-sheaf of say abelian groups, for example, uh, is uh, a pre-sheaf of abelian groups uh, is the data. Uh, where to every open subset we we have uh, we have an abelian group, uh, and then we have these restriction maps uh, uh, where we take a function. Well, we, I shouldn't call it a function; it's an abelian group. We can somehow restrict it to the smaller open set. And the one condition we satisfy is that if we have uh, one, if we have an open set contained in a smaller, uh, contained a bigger open set, contained a bigger open set, you can restrict and then restrict, and you should get the same thing as restricting all points. So functions were our motivating, uh, were our motivating example for that. Uh, so, uh, and then to make turn things into sheaves, we have two additional axioms, and this is uh, the topology comes in more seriously at this point, where if we have a cover by open sets, uh, then then uh, we have two axioms. The identity axiom says that if you have two sections over an open set and they agree locally on every element of the uh, cover, then they must mean the same functions. Uh, and the other is that if you have a bunch of things you're trying to glue together, uh, and all you need to be able to glue them together is you need to have, they need to be defined over everything in the open set, uh, every open set making up your big thing, and they have to agree on the overlaps, uh, and, uh, and then they glue together. And thanks to the previous axiom, this, the thing they glue together must be unique. So basically, you could say this gluings are unique if they exist, and then gluings exist. So when you say it that way, it feels like they should be said all at once, but really they shouldn't. And for experts, there should be, you should think of this as a, uh, there, there are things that are more fancier than sheaves, like two sheaves or three sheaves and so forth. A two sheaf is really a stack. Uh, and so you can try to think about what comes next in the sequence if you are an expert. Okay, let me periodically update uh, and then, uh, Oh, I might as well say something fancy, which is uh, people asked about descent. And I should say descent is just gluing, as far as I'm concerned. So whenever you hear the word descent, well, okay, not in real life, but uh, in algebraic geometry, uh, then you should really just think gluing. So I could call these descent axioms if you wanted to, if you want to really uh, impress people and frighten your neighbors. So uh, the issues you brought up uh, are, are, you brought up a lot of different issues, but I think you made friends with a lot of the notions uh, in category theory if you were not already familiar with them. Uh, and in particular, a lot of the questions people are asking about were why were the, why do we make these definitions, uh, usually asked about specific definitions. And in particular, I think people are wisely skeptical and suspicious, but willing to at least be convinced. And the, uh, the and the, uh, the idea is that I feel like 
when you learn mathematics, uh, publicly we're no, no longer allowed to say that we teach, so we teach people how to think. Uh, instead, we're supposed to just teach people facts and have learning goals. But really, when you learn mathematics, period, it's, it looks like it's about all about these facts and techniques, but really it's about uh, changing how you, uh, really changing how, you're, how you think when you see certain kinds of problems. And categorical thinking is maybe the most mathematical thinking there is in the sense in that it changes very much the way you think. Uh, and uh, I, actually there's an interesting uh, discussion or comments from Emily Real that I want to write more about, maybe put in a post uh, where I said things in a more deliberately strong phrase, uh, phrasing, but I should have said it. I feel like I'm glad I did, but I, uh, it was stronger than I meant. And then she convinced me otherwise. Uh, so, so in particular, uh, if you've never seen Yoneda before, you never really thought about it, you should, and people's comments, and when they said what problems they like, really seem to get this across, that uh, it, once you do it, something happens to you, and you can never tell anyone else what happened. Uh, you'll you'll say it, and they won't understand how. Uh, uh, they'll ask what the content is, and it's a triviality. It's a tautology. That's there's really nothing there in ditto for universal properties, and yet uh, there's a huge amount there, and it takes more and more and more time to digest it. Okay, so. Great. So, uh, so let's see. I can. Maybe we're going to be stuck. Nope. I, I can make this work. Great. Uh, okay. So last week I, I said something on purpose that I was intending to bring up this week, uh, and then some of you caught it in advance. So I, I discussed uh, as an example of adjointness and forgetful functors that if you have integral domains and you, uh, if you have a domain, you can make a fraction field, field of fractions. And uh, I pointed out the following statement, which is that for every integral domain, you get, you get the corresponding fraction field and you can make this into uh, examples of adjoints uh, because maps of domains from the domain into the field uh, equals, uh, are naturally the same as maps of the fraction field as fields into, uh, into K. Uh, and so uh, that hopefully was enlightening, except some of you pointed out that it seems to be false, because if you take the integers, uh, you could definitely get a map to the field Z mod two or F two, but there's no corresponding map from Q to Z mod two. So it looks like I made a mistake, uh, but I did not, I didn't lie. I just did not tell you I just was suspiciously silent. So in particular, the thing I deliberately did not say uh, is, is exactly what I meant by this thing here, because certainly you all uh, know, or I'll assume you know what a domain is. Uh, but, uh, and so you know what the objects of this category are, but we didn't say what the morphisms are. And so to make this work as in real time, people watching last week no noted, is that if you said that a map of integral domains is an inclusion, then this becomes true. Uh, so, uh, so the way uh, you should think about this, uh, or the lesson you should take from this, that works, is, uh, uh, is uh, are, are, are around fourfold. First of all, the definition of morphisms came second. First, you had the adjoint. This is nature's way of telling you that this is what morphisms of integral domains want to be. They're not morphisms of rings that just are restricted integral domains. You have to uh, it, it, it wants to be something something better. Uh, secondly, I guess it, uh, there's the there's the fact that you have the sloppiness in how we talk about categories, where you often leave the morphisms implicit. And that okay, that's really that's actually dangerous, of course. But uh, it's also necessary for human beings because otherwise you just get swamped by notation. So when you say something, uh, when you say something like if you have some category like a uh, category of abelian groups, I mean write it this way, and I say G is in it then I really mean G is an object in it. Uh, but that kind of sloppiness is just, it is human. And similarly, when you talk about a topological space, when you say X is a topological space, well, usually you just mean that that's the set and implicit is the, are the open sets. Uh, okay, lesson three, that's kind of obvious, is that usually when you are defining some notion, the notion of an isomorphism is easier than the notion of morphism. It's kind of obvious. You know what an isomorphism of integral domain should be, or at least what you think it is, it has to be that. 
Uh, and so somehow, uh, at first I used to think, well, you just define the morphisms and isomorphism of the consequence, but really the isomorphisms somehow are more fundamental than uh, are prior to the morphisms. And then lastly, in retrospect, uh, once you make the definition, you can reverse engineer your brain to, to convince yourself that that's what it should have been all along if you're paying attention. And so what's a map of integral domains? It should, it should uh, preserve the key structures of an integral domain. And in particular, it should send zero to zero, but it should also send non-zero things to non-zero things. And so you, you may say, why would you, like, how would you know that? And I, it's purely by reverse engineering. It's purely uh, extending our intuition by, uh, uh, by seeing what needs to make it, what, by seeing what needs to be true. Okay, let me remember to do that. Uh, okay, so uh, more from last time. I'm actually going to spend a good chunk of time just seemingly talking about last time. Is that we had examples of geometric spaces, and I should say when I say this, this is not something that I have defined or that anyone defines. Uh, so this has no precise meaning unless you want to give it some, uh, but they're just, you know it if you see it, and you know it if you see one. So you've got your favorite examples uh, and- uh, Hey, Ravi. Oh, yes. We're getting a request to refresh again. Yes, thank you. To- uh... Good, uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, so a geometric space, uh, so when I was giving examples of sheaves of functions, I said, consider geometric space and look at this thing, it forms a sheaf. Now I'd like to say it backwards and say, what is a geometric space? Well, uh, it is, it includes the following information. It's a topological space uh, with a sheaf of functions. So I wanna separate that deliberately into uh, a set uh, with a topology and then with a sheaf of rings and that rings, those rings I'll just call functions. So I'm not calling, so when I see, say sheaf of functions, uh, I'm saying everything backwards. And so this is the definition of a ring space. Uh, and so, okay, so I've just find something and then you wanna know what the category is, what the, what the morphisms are. Uh, and the, uh, so let me deliberately leave that vague, but you should really want to know what a morphism is. And that means you should really uh, want to be able to guess what it is. And so maybe if you haven't seen it before, the thing you should do is not go to Wikipedia and immediately look it up, uh, but to figure out yourself what it has to be. And if you're wrong, it's okay, but it's way better to try and figure it out yourself. But the notion of an isomorphism is what it has to be, which is, uh, so saying it all in terms of these, uh, in terms of the three ways of building up this geometric space, we need, first of all, an isomorphism at the level of sets, which we also, which people usually call bijections. Then we need to extend that to an isomorphism of topological spaces. This is what, of course, we call homeomorphisms. And then what do we do with the rings? Once you have the homeomorphism, you've identified the topological spaces. And so now the sheaves you can, of rings you can think of as being on the same topological spaces. So now you need an isomorphism of rings on this topological space. But everything to make sense has to be built on the thing you built uh, beforehand. Okay, so now let me, uh, so now let me uh, give an example of, co uh, of complex manifolds. Now, the only problem with that is I haven't defined them yet, although you may know what they are or have your own idea. So one thing, one thing we, you, we do know uh, about are the open sets in C to the N. Uh, and, so, and so we can have on that the sheaf of homomorphic functions. Uh, uh, so functions that are complex analytic. And what are maps from one of these things to another? Well, we just let them be holomorphic functions on U sitting inside C to the N, mapping to C to the N, and just line, they should, the image should lie inside V. So in other words, it should be the data of a bunch of, of M, that's the same M, holomorphic functions on, the, on U. So that's our category. I told you what the objects are, I told you what the morphisms are. You get, uh, now the question is, Isomorphisms may not be, I don't know how obvious isomorphisms are, they're not so obvious, uh, but it's a local model for a complex manifold. Uh, and then you could do similar things in R to the N, uh, and then you could take your functions to be smooth functions or differentiable functions or continuous functions, or after once you start to do this, you realize that other things like piecewise linear functions or linear functions end up being something, you know, there are other examples that you just can't help but begin to see once you do it this way. 
So these are local models of the spaces we want to do. And then I can now finally make the definition uh, of a complex manifold. Uh, and I don't think this should be the definition you should first have seen. Or uh, it might be, but then at least you should have in your mind the idea of what it should be. So here's the definition, which should make you upset the first time you see it. Uh, a complex manifold, it's a ring space, uh, and it's covered by open subsets. A ring space is a topological space. It's covered by open subsets, and any open subset gives you a smaller ring, an open sub ringed space. I guess you could make up words sub ringed space or something like this. But you know what I mean. Uh, uh, and, so, and each one should be of the form, which really means isomorphic to. And we know what isomorphisms are, even if we're not completely sure what morphisms are. Uh, it, it, it should be covered by opens that are isomorphic as ring spaces to subsets of the complex numbers, uh, along with the sheaf of Holobarger functions. And so that's it. That's the definition. It's really short. And so one question several people asked was essentially, why is a sheaf? Like, what do you do with this notion? And this is not the answer. This is just one of multi, a plethora of answers. The definition of manifold, a very fast definition, is using the language of sheets. Um, I, I have a hard time thinking of a better, shorter definition. I just have to think of a better definition in some metric. But in other metrics, this is the best definition there possibly is. Um, and then you immediately can define smooth manifold or differential manifold or a piecewise linear manifold where you, in each case, it's a ring space that's covered by opens that are isomorphic to the sheaf of uh, to the sheaf of smooth functions, differential functions, piecewise linear functions. So all those are now defined. And at this point, you know what they are. You know what isomorphisms of those things are. And the only thing that should you should feel a lack of well, you should feel a lack of many things: um, uh, world peace, uh, an end to hunger, uh, but also morphisms of these, like what is a morph from a complex manifold in this language uh, and, uh, and ditto for the others. So what's the category of such things? And the second question that you should really be dying to know the answer to is why is this definition equal to the one that you may already have in your head? Or if you have no actual definition, you just have a, uh, you have an idea of what you want a manifold to be, why is it that this is a reasonable way of formalizing what you have to say? Okay, so I hope you're bothered by that and I hope that people uh, who find this very strange looking can uh, try to digest this this week as well, because I think there's, I found a huge amount of enlightenment that, uh, in, under, in digesting what this means. Great. Now here's something slightly fancier, even if you see manifolds. Uh, I'll now define a complex analytic variety. And so what is it? Well, it's again a ring space uh, and it's covered by open sets and the open sets are locally isomorphic to well, all I need to do is tell you the local model is a ring space. And the answer of what that's going to be is you just take something which is locally, somehow you take an old fashioned open subset, and then you take a closed subset of that. But in this, what subsets are you going to allow? I want them just to be those that are cut out by holomorphic equations, by complex analytic functions on that open set. Uh, so those are my sets. And that has, the, uh, so that's the set. Uh, it's got a topological structure. So if, uh, that's the topological space. What are the rings? What's the sheaf of rings? All I have to do is tell you on one of those open sets uh, what the functions are that we're counting. And the functions on such a, a z or z are defined to be just restrictions of holomorphic functions on the honest open set. So you can have, now, uh, you can have uh, uh, sort of all sorts of things that are no, no longer smooth uh, that, uh, that have all sorts of things of various different sorts of dimensions. Uh, if you, you can have accumulation points, uh, if you know some complex analysis, you can, there's some things you cannot have necessarily, uh, but you have to make this definition work. And I guess a meta question is, is this the right definition? Are you happy with it? Is it wrong? What do you need to do to uh, actually fix it? Okay. but. Once you fix it and say everything correctly, you now know what a variety of complex analytic varieties. And I guess you essentially might even know what morphisms are, what the categories are, how to do business with it, how to use the Weierstrass preparation theorem. Uh, so that is so great. So now you know what that is. Uh, and 
Then, yet more discussion from last week. You, many of you pointed out that when you did the following problem, uh, that uh, for any of your reasonable spaces, then the, the stocks of the chief of function, uh, maybe in case I never said it, I should say that the chief of functions on a ring space, uh, that's the sheaf of rings, that's often called the structure sheaf. And it's often, as we discuss from the, okay, it wasn't Finnish, it was Estonian or something, uh, or possibly Italian for olomorphic as, as there are several possibilities proposed as to why that's called O. Uh, so for any reasonable space, uh, the stocks are local rings. And uh, so that was in some sense, the thing I asked you to think about, but in the course of thinking about it, uh, many of you, everyone I saw who actually solved it, uh, thought about it in the following way, which is that you have a maximum ideal, how do you know it's a local ring? It's because you have a maximum ideal, which you identified because it came from functions vanishing at our point P. So in other words, you have your functions defined near P and you can mud out by this thing and that map is nothing more than evaluate at P. Modding out by the maximum ideal is validating at P. And so in the course of it, uh, several people explicitly pointed out that you're using the fact that every function on your reasonable geometric space is continuous. And uh, really what you're using is the fact that the locus when at, where f is zero is a closed subset. Uh, so that's just obviously true in your geometric spaces that, uh, that you actually care about. Okay, so now let me just formalize this. And now I'm gonna make a definition, uh, but I'm gonna write in very small font so you can't read what I'm writing. Uh, so, okay. A locally ring space formalizes this. This is the thing which makes your argument work. So it's a ring space. Uh, and uh, so that ring space, we'll call it just, okay, there it is. And I want, so it's a topological space with a sheaf of rings. And I want for every point of it, I want uh, the stock to be a local ring. And then I want to say a little bit more. So if you read carefully, uh, there's, and furthermore, I have to write really small, and then you can read more and figure out what that is. Uh, and you should, I mean, I think you should want to know what that says. You can complain about my handwriting. You can go look it up, but maybe before looking it up, you should try to think a little bit about what you want it to mean. And so what you want it to mean means the following things are true. So if you have a germ of a function, so if you have an element of a stock, and so, for example, in particular, if you have just an honest section over some open set and then a point in that open set, well, then you get a germ of the function at that point. Then I want to say that the value of the point is f mod that maximum ideal. So this is backwards from, so we're just saying the same thing as we said before, but backwards that, uh, that now I'm not defining the maximum ideal in this way uh, by knowing the value of the function at a point. I'm defining the function's value at a point by modding up by the maximal ideal. So it is uh, backwards. And I'm just going to declare that the f mod the maximal ideal to be the value of f at that point. Uh, and so values take our elements of the field because a ring mod maximal ideal is a field. And so we'll use the language that f is, takes that value of p. And so f vanishes at p if f is 0 uh, in that local ring, or equivalently if it's in the maximal ideal. Uh, and so similarly, uh, we can talk about the locus inside an open set where a section vanishes, where a function vanishes. And uh, with all the language now being backwards to what you actually uh, first would have thought about locally linked spaces, the thing you needed to make this work is that the locus where a function vanishes should be closed. And now you might be getting a little bit of an idea of what I was writing about upside here where things got very scribbly and messy. So I'll put this here so you can zoom in on that spot and try to figure out the definition. Uh, and uh, one, one thing just to be aware of, I feel like I'm, there are many important things I'm not telling you and leaving for yourself. And then there's seemingly small things like this. I wanna make a point telling you uh, because it's a source of confusion for at least people like me, which is uh, if you have a function on a locally ring space, then you, by definition, you can make sense of the value of f at a point. But for a sheaf in general, there is no such definition. You cannot talk about, when talking about a sheaf in general, 
and I'm going to avoid Jonathan, who's going to argue with the espace étalé uh, description that there's uh, a way around this, but that I think might make you more confused at first, uh, or at least it'll make you more like Jonathan. Uh, so the uh, so we have for, uh, so we so for an arbitrary sheaf, you can't talk about the value of p, but you can talk about the germ. And you can think about this as being by definition the germ is what's going on near p, uh, very near p, so near that it's in any given neighborhood. Uh, whereas that's still somehow bigger than the, the what's happening at p. Great. So now we are ready to talk about varieties and schemes. And these are going to be things we want to do geometrically, think about in terms of geometry. And so what this means is we need to have a set that has that random topology, and we need to come up with a sheaf of rings on this. And basically, we want a local model that we we'll use to build the big sort of thing. And of course, after the fact, we should look back and say, yes, we wanted to make that, that that's wanted to make the definition of something which is actually useful. So in the examples for, for here on in, I want to follow through uh, a bunch of things simultaneously and whoever uh, you are and what you're interested in may mean that you are focused more on one or other of these things. So there's complex analytic varieties, which we've already talked about, uh, but now I'll, those are briefly on hold, but they'll come back if you prefer those. Uh, but what I'd like to uh, instead uh, focus on are, depending on who you are, uh, possibly, if you, if you are seeing varieties for the first or second or maybe third time, uh, the ring I'm going to think about is going to be finally generated over the complex numbers. So in other words, it's a polynomial ring modded by some ideal. And then the variants of that are, you could do this instead over an arbitrarily, arbitrary algebraically closed field or, or just a general field. Uh, and so I want to do all simultaneously but I really feel like the first one to do is, is this one here. And then everything else ends up being variations on the theme. I just prefer to go from the concrete to the general than to go from the general to the concrete. But if you want to go general, then I also want to talk about rings in general, for, which will allow us to define schemes. And then things maybe become interesting when, uh, so you, first of all, you should pick one of these, but then any one of these is an example of a general ring. And yet the constructions are not the same. and so. There's two kinds of geometric space, and then how to think about that. Okay, so what's the set? Uh, the set is uh, quick to say. Uh, it's just the set of prime ideals. If you're talking about, oh, I have this backwards. Uh, so uh, the, the set of prime ideals uh, gives you is what we're going to use when we're talking about schemes, and the set of maximal ideals is what we'll talk about when we're talking about uh, varieties, and we'll call them spec and m spec. And it's an interesting historical uh, and mathematical question as to why this is, why the word spectrum. And I, I feel like there's like lots of reasons why it's there. And I don't know, after the fact, there are more and more reasons. So I won't try to say anything here, but that's a potentially a source of uh, worthwhile things to, to talk about or argue about. Okay, so that's our, so that's the set. And there's no, why yet. Yeah, I'm just making the definition and leaving the why for a second. And so, uh, but we want to think about them geometrically. This is supposed to be geometry. So we have to take those sets and draw pictures. And then we'll worry about the topology later. It won't be very long. Uh, and so what I want you to do is this is something where it would be great if I had more time, I would just do a bunch of examples. And I, I guess instead what I'd much rather, uh, well, not that I'd much rather, I guess for the sake of time, read the examples in detail. If you skip the examples, you don't understand what's going on. Uh, and uh, examples in the notes don't use the language of M-spec, but just do M-spec if you prefer uh, that. Uh, and But even if you are a variety person, I think an important thing to still think about is the notion of the spec or M-spec of the integers, because one of these huge mysteries and morals uh, is that the integers and polynomials or polynomials in one variable of an arbitrary field, they are really similar. They're unique factorization domains, they're uh, no theory, and there's like lots and lots of reasons. And one reason uh, is that when you draw a picture of them, the picture of this, of, of this picture looks like that, and this picture looks like that, and it's the same picture. Uh, and what does that mean? Well, they're both smooth curves. Well, what does smooth mean? What does curve mean? Well, now 
we just go down that rabbit hole, but instead, uh, uh, let's just look at the rabbit hole and admire the work of the rabbits, and we'll go down that hole later. Let me make sure this is updated. And uh, I, uh, great. And so the one fact uh, to know, and I'm just seeing this because I get to express my own point of view, which is definitely not universally held, uh, is that the Nelson sats, well, first of all, there's something that people sometimes call the Nelson sats that uh, is a little bit different. But the thing that most people call the Nelson sats, uh, uh, well, even then, there's several things, but they're all very similar. And I, I prefer just because I never remember the exact form of the general form of the Nelson sats. I prefer Zariski's lemma just because I can remember it, which is just that if you have a field extension that's finally generated as an algebra, then it's finally generated as a vector space, uh, which means it's a finite extension of fields. So from that, you get anything else you might want. And I guess an interesting fact is that this is, I call this sort of hard in the technical sense that where I mean hard is something where if you see it for the first time, it's not something so clear uh, how to prove. Uh, and ditto for the null Stalin sets. I mean, there's a reason why Hobart proved it and not someone else. Uh, uh, so uh, it's hard and then later it becomes easy once you realize how to think about it, but it's really not obvious how to think about it. No, I don't think it's obvious. Actually, a neat thing to read is uh, in Terry Tao's blog, I think he gives a proof for the null Stalin sets uh, where it's the proof he gets by following his nose, which is not the fastest proof because that's, he knows is not the goal, but it's the most natural proof and you, read it and you follow what he's doing and it makes sense and then you understand. So I think uh, the many, many different proofs are useful. Uh, and and we'll, maybe we'll prove this uh, accidentally by geometry. And let me go back. Great, good. So I'm leaving you in the middle of that chapter and going back. So at this point for varieties and schemes, your mission is to uh, understand the set and be able to draw pictures of them. And in particular, that means you will have a way of picturing prime ideals, not just maximum ideals, at least in cases where the rings are kind of reasonable. And then just like we learned how to think of the category of integral domains correctly uh, by seeing how they had to work, similarly, the pictures after the fact kind of make all the sense in the world. And I guess this sort of, I, don't, I have no idea who this, where this insight dates to, Presumably, it is somewhere between the Italian school or the German community of algebraists uh, or is risky, uh, but I'm not, uh, I absolutely don't know what I'm talking about when talking the history of mathematics, but I'm absolutely happy to just say stuff, um, whether or not it's true. Okay, good. So let me go back to Sheaves and, uh, to, uh, and say a few more things that we're going to want to know. Uh, the first thing is that if we have, uh, is uh, going to be about uh, pre-sheaves. And so we have a morphism of pre-sheaves. Well, uh, a reminder of what a morphism is. Um, uh, so a morphism of pre-sheaves, uh, once you know what a pre-sheaf is, you want to know what a morphism wants to be. And then you have to realize it's the only thing it can be, which is it's got to be something which preserves the structure uh, of uh, the algebraic structure. And so uh, morphism is a data of, of, uh, 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 for every open set of a map like this. It has to preserve the structure, which is the restriction maps. And so I'm using, uh, in case you haven't seen this before, this means that the diagram commutes. And then you can define subsheaf, which is, just means that each of these things should be sub uh, uh, and su sub pre-sheaf as well. And if there's sheaves in the groups, you know what that means and things like that. Okay, so now comes fancy sounding statement. Uh, which is uh, so, which is that the uh, pre sheaves of abelian groups form an abelian category. So, uh, so, if you have a map of sheaves of abelian groups, well, you know what that is. It's just a map open set by open set, making this diagram, uh, make it, making this diagram commute. Uh, so, I will now tell you what the kernel pre sheaf and the co kernel pre sheaf is. And the thing I want to emphasize is that sometimes people will just say, here's the definition of it, but you're not allowed to. Kernel and co kernel have meanings already, uh, and you can't just make them anything you want. You have to have a reason for it. But 
still, I will say the only reasonable thing you might say, and then you'll be led to the, and then you'll be led to the right notion. So, so this is a map of groups. And so it's got a kernel. Let me call this field U. This is field B. And so it has a kernel. Uh, and if you are happy with the language of exact sequences, you'll let me do this. But if you're not, you can just ignore the zeros at the end. Um, great. So you have a map like that. And similarly, similarly for V, you have a map like that. And now you, that they're induced, there's induced a vertical map like this because if you think about it, um, anything here uh, that anything here that goes to zero here must have also gone to zero here. So it's some you get something here which is in the kernel of this map, and now you can see why things get messy. And I'm glad this the red ink evaporates. So you have a map like that, and you can think a little bit about why why you would have a, a map like this as well too. So. The great thing now is I just, uh, so I have maps like this. And now I can just define a kernel uh, pre-sheaf and co-kernel pre-sheaf. Well, what should it be? Well, the kernel pre-sheaf of U should be probably, you might guess, if there's going to be anything, it should be that. And similarly for the co-kernel. And great, so that's, that's a reasonable guess. But then you have to prove that it's, it really is a kernel and co-kernel. And the great thing about it is because of the way pre sheaves work and morphism pre sheaves work, it's really not hard to do. So you should not just nod your head. You should figure out what does it mean, what do I have to check, and it actually works. And then you are a, then you then you're happy at least for a few minutes of your life. Uh, and but maybe you become unhappy a little bit after. So what happens if you do this for sheaves? Uh, then uh, for sheaves, if you have a morphism of sheaves of a billion groups. Then, first of all, one thing I want to say is that the kernel, oh, actually, let me go back a sec. Was, uh, I, have, I apologize. One thing I, I have not done but that I wanted to do uh, is to say okay, theorem. Pre-sheaves of a billion groups to one billion category. Great. So this looks like you need to know what a billion category is, but I don't remember exactly what a billion category is and what the axioms are. But all that really matters is you know how kernels and co-kernels work in images and that they behave the way they do for modules over rings or for billion groups. And the reason they do is because everything you do, all constructions you make, all are open set by open set. And the structure maps come for free. There's no extra thing to check. You don't have to worry about them existing because the structure maps you already checked once and for all will always play well with whatever you do. So that's it. That's the, you don't need to know what a billion categories, you just need to know what a billion groups are. Uh, and similarly for modules. But for sheaves, uh, you could try to do the same thing. So if you have a morphism of sheaves of a billion groups, well, that's a morphism of pre-sheaves where F and U just happen to be sheaves. And then the kernel of this map, it turns out, uh, is, a, uh, is, a, uh, is a sheaf. And so this is a worthwhile exercise to do. Why is it that if F is a sheaf, then the kernel of the map will also satisfy those extra bonus to axioms? Uh, and so once you do that, it's a much easier exercise, if you already know it's a sheaf, to show that it's a kernel. Think about what it means to be a kernel, what the universal property is. And then you realize it just satisfies it because it is a kernel for pre -sheaf. OK, so that is good news. Uh, and, uh, so, and so now, uh, th but the question is, what happens with co-kernels? And there, something bad happens. So something to meditate on as you walk around today is that if you have uh, F, to, F to G is a morphism of pre-sheaves of a billion groups, then, okay, we have a kernel and co-kernels. We're kind of happy with that. Oh, I guess I, I should say I'm now using new notation, uh, which is now rather than evaluating it at open sets, this is, these are exact sequences of sheaves of a billion groups. Uh, so in other words, uh, that's kernel of the map of sheaves. Oh, sorry, you can't see what I'm pointing at. This is a map of, uh, this, this is, uh, makes sense. We're talking about maps of sheaves, not, over, not about sections. But you can think about as you walk around, why cheaply the, uh, that, that at, for every point, you get a map of stocks. Uh, and so why cheaply the kernel, the, uh, the, the stock of the kernel is the kernel of the stocks. 
and the co-kernel of the SOX is the SOX of the kernel. I should have said that latter one in the opposite order. Uh, and it can become verbiage, but if you just think about a little bit what it actually means, it's entirely reasonable uh, to know why that's true. Okay, so in other words, the kernel and co-kernel at the level of stocks for pre-sheaves also work well. Uh, okay, and so now, uh, so now I want to say the first couple of things in a bunch of ideas and leave the rest for you to, to read uh, and ponder. It's that the thing about sheaves that, that are better than pre-sheaves, sheaves, you can recover global things from local things. That's the entire point of being able to woo. The identity axiom says you can recognize global things by what they are by looking locally. And wooability says you can build anything global by building them locally. And so uh, the real, uh, really useful way of thinking about sheaves, an alternative really useful way that sort of somehow opposite to open sets uh, is that you can understand sheaves by their stocks. And so the first example, which I'll give you as something to think about, I'll put it as on the problem set slash, set slash homework, let me, uh, but I'm also going to do it for you right now too, which should make it in theory easier for you to do. So, uh, right, so the statement is that sections of a sheaf on X, X is gonna be a topological space, and let's call the sheaf F, are determined by their germs. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if I have, uh, let's say I have an open set U and I have two sections of the sheaf over, the open, uh, over this open set. And let's say I know that for all points of my open set, their germs are the same. Then I claim that in fact, F is G. So this should look like the identity axiom. And the way I think about this is the identity axiom is what happens on an open set, covered by open sets. This is what happens, this is like a stock identity axiom for what happens stock by stock. So uh, it happens at the level of germs. So why is this true? Well, it means that for any point P, we, the fact that FP equals GP, well, our definition of the stocks, we said two things, two germs are the same if there's an honest real life open set. On, with, on which F equals G. So there's a little open neighborhood of P on which they are the same section. And that's true for every open set. And so we have covered U by open sets on which F equals G on each of them. And then that is the identity axiom. Uh, it, you directly use it to show that F is G. So that's it. There's not much to, uh, there's not a whole lot to the proof. It's just practice with the concept. Uh, and, and so we've actually then proved that if we have a map, this map uh, from sections to, to the stocks is an injection. So we can identify sections by that. And so what we'd like to do is to figure out uh, what is in the image of this map. If we did, we could understand all the sections by way, we can understand all the sections by way of germs. So, uh, here, so, uh, so here's the idea. Uh, and this is something where I want you to read and to see why that's true. But the previous slide, the previous idea of, of, of needing germs to be the same uh, is, uh, uh, I'm give you the idea that uh, the germs come from a section. If, uh, so if, if, I, if you have a space, and I'm gonna try to do this visually, if you, have a, if you have a space and you have a bunch of points in it and you have all these different germs and you're wondering if they fit together to form an actual section, well, then what you want is that somehow they should be compatible, like near here, uh, like near, well, I won't even try to say it, because I think when you try to formalize it, you end up saying this, the, the definition. So somehow if you have all the stocks, all the germs, and they're all compatible, then, uh, then that tells you whether you're in the image. And this is like an important notion of compatible germs, and I'll let you think about that and read that. Okay, and so when you read it, so when you read it, uh, then uh, you will immediately after that realize that this is useful in a bunch of ways. One of which is maybe not immediately useful uh, is the notion of, of uh, sheafification. Uh, and so there's still the question of why you'd wanna do this perhaps, 
uh, compatible germs not feel like we've answered the why question because it was the answer to a question, not the question itself. But cheapification is going to be like groupification or the ification kinds of things that you've been thinking about otherwise anyway. And so if you have a pre sheaf F, uh, then I want to say that the chiefification is the uh, it satisfies a universal property, which is if you have any sheaf, other sheaf G on, we're always working on a fixed topological space. And if you have any other map from the pre sheaf F to the sheaf G, then there exists a unique map making this diagram commute. So this should remind you of groupification or anything like that. So this is the sheaf that best approximates the pre sheaf. And then there, um, once you actually think this through, uh, this thing to think about much later in life is why is the map going this way? Like what's the, why is this uh, uh, the right definition to make? Okay, so uh, that's the definition of sheafification. And then the great thing is after you make the definition, it's the answer to lots of questions. You, you, the questions that you're asking before, such as, well, co-kernel pre-sheaves, uh, what's a co-kernel of sheaves? It's not what I thought it was. And there are many other things you want to make work. And the, it works trivially and easily for pre-sheaves, but it doesn't work for sheaves. What do you do? The answer usually is you sheaf apply. And the reason why is because of the direction the arrows go. And you are not going to believe it just by me saying it. You have to actually understand it in your gut by uh, doing a few of them. And then you realize, yes, that's exactly why we need to sheaf apply in some situations of don't need to sheaf apply. Okay, so a related, uh, so, uh, so a related uh, notion is the notion of a sheaf on a base. Uh, and so let me say this and have this as motivation. Uh, so, uh, so, the, so, so a base of a topology, A, a base of a topology, well, so if you have X and you have a bunch of open sets and they can be really weird, uh, then a base of a topology is a subset, a sub a collection of open sets of X, uh, such that every open set in X is the union of some of these. So an example would be sort of uh, balls in some sort of metric space. Open balls, I guess, in a metric space. And somehow when you, I mean, in some sense, the first time you learn about topological spaces, when you secretly learn about them, when you see deltas and epsilons in the horrific part of calculus, uh, then uh, secretly that's about topology and the fact that you are understanding open sets by way of honest actual uh, actual balls. So, uh, so we like these for various reasons. Usually, a lot of things on actual balls are easier to compute. Uh, they, I could say in some moral reason which you depending on who you are you are you might find completely mysterious or very obvious is that they're topologically trivial there's uh so we can do things like we can uh integrate we can well there are lots of constructions you can do things you know convergent power series uh so uh that's why it's often convenient not to work with arbitrary crazy open sets which have a bunch of components and lots of holes but to just have certain nice open sets and uh sufficiently small open sets and so you can often understand, uh, well, you can understand sheaves by just understanding how they behave on a base. How, for example, if you know what the section of the ball is. So what does this possibly mean? So what is the notion of a sheaf on a base? Well, uh, so you have, what's the base? It is a bunch of open sets. And every open U in X is the union of some, some of these. So, okay, so how, what, what would it mean to know about the sheaf knowing just about things over the base? Well, what you're gonna to want to know is if, if you know F is going to be a sheaf on the base, in other words, I'm not gonna tell you section over every open set. So, uh, uh, so if, I, if I have an honest sheaf, I get a sheaf on the base by simply just considering the basic open sets. And so we definitely need to have restriction maps. We definitely would have restriction maps. 
And now the identity axiom has to be a little bit, you have to be a little bit careful because the intersection of two open sets is always open, but the intersection of two balls is not necessarily a ball. The intersection of two um, basic open sets is not necessarily a basic open set. However, it's covered by definition of the base by a bunch of smaller things in the base. So what does the identity axiom mean? It means that if, if you have two, if you have two elements, uh, two sections over one basic element, uh, and uh, sorry, that is not, uh, that's actually, no, this is for the ruleability, I'm sorry. If I have a bunch of, if I have a bunch of sections uh, over different elements in my base, and they agree on the overlap, well, what does that mean? It means that they agree for all, or perhaps sufficiently many that cover it, uh, th uh, that are inside the overlap. Then that must mean they were the same function to begin with. And similarly for ruleability. So you make your definition to be the only thing it could possibly be. And uh, for what a, you can have a pre-sheep on a base and that's and then a sheep on a base with the identity on a base and ruleability on a base. And you just add the word on a base to every noun and verb and adjective you, you, you say in a sentence and it makes sense. And the statement, which is incredibly believable if you have an intuition for the base of the topology is that this should be the same information. It should be, uh, they should be the same information or if you wanna be fancy, I could say it's an equivalence of categories if you want to formalize it. But all I really mean to say is that if I tell you a sheaf on a base, you can tell me the sheaf that it wants to be that it's a restriction of. And how do you do that? Well, you need to tell me the sections over any open set. And how do you do that? Well, one way to do it is to, uh, well, one way to do it is open set by open set, uh, which is the way some of you will do this exercise. Others will be by compatible stocks, which magically makes it trivial, uh, which is a good advertisement for compatible stock. Okay, so uh, so right now it's uh, it's almost nine o'clock Pacific time. So I think I'd like to uh, tell you just briefly where we're going and then see if there are any general questions uh, that people want to ask sort of in public and then we'll stop the recording uh, and then I can hang around for another half hour and I'll go to Zulip and, uh, uh, and see what interesting questions there are and possibly the shepherds have very interesting things to tell me uh, or to ask about as well. So uh, where we are right now is, uh, is, is we'll fairly quickly be forced into the notion of a, of a variety in the scheme. Uh, and the interesting tricky thing that maybe isn't, that I, is hidden so far is the notion of a morphism. And so if you can think about why the morphism of complex analytic spaces or complex manifolds, what the right definition of that is, you'll gradually be led to the right notion of morphisms of varieties. Uh, and schemes is slightly, there's one extra tweak to worry about. Uh, but once we have that, then at that point, we are uh, ready to go in any number of possible directions. Uh, and the direction I may go, uh, because it's most fundamentally geometric, uh, is using line bundles uh, and maps, projective space, and uh, things like that that will let us understand curves. So, uh, but there are other things such as uh, what does smoothness mean? What does dimension mean? Uh, and these are hard concepts and you've just forgotten that they are hard. And maybe as two examples uh, that are good uh, food for thought, uh, if I give you two manifolds, uh, or, or if I give you one manifold and it's a five dimensional real manifold, how do you, if I give it to you only as a topological space with, uh, let's say a ring space, uh, how is it that you can recover its dimension knowing only that? And then I'll tie your hands behind your back a little, which is if I just tell you the set, can you tell me what the dimension is? And if I just tell you the, top, the topological space, can you tell me what the dimension is? Uh, uh, and then a related thing will be smoothness, which is how do you tell if I give you a ring space uh, and I need to give you an example because it should come from geometry. Um, how do I know whether something is smooth? So for example, uh, if I give you a complex analytic variety, that's our only example of things that are not smooth so far. Uh, how do you, if I give it to you only as a ring space, 
how do you tell which points are manifold fields and which points are, are not? And those questions are, are, are hard in the same way that the dimension of a vector space in linear algebra, you've forgotten it, but it's hard. It's a weird definition the first time you see it. And it's somewhat a miracle that that's the right definition. In fact, it's not the right definition, but that's a separate question. Okay, so why don't we, it's nine o'clock even here. So uh, before stopping the recording, maybe I'll just see if there are questions or comments or things that, especially if the shepherds think are worth saying in public before like saying, uh, so people watching later will be able to uh, get certain confusions sorted out uh, right away. 